we'll be started on this uh, subject about why there is such an irrational hatred in this world toward the Jew. And it's been like that for, for all of time, basically. It's amazing. You have a little dinky country. You realize that San Bernardino County is two and a half times bigger than the entire state of Israel. It's amazing. Little dinky country. They don't have a great army as such. They don't have big ports and monster, you know, mega cities and all this kind of stuff. And yet they are always the center of the world's attention. You think maybe there might be something behind the scenes that we're not aware of here. Why does Satan fixate on this country? So we ask the question, you know, why do people hate the Jews? Well, the answer I was always given, you know, when I was a kid and growing up and so forth, well, it's because they killed Jesus. They put Jesus on the cross and they killed Jesus and that's why, you know, the average person hates the Jews. because They killed Jesus. Well, that's, come on, let's think about that for a second. The average person in this world doesn't give a flip who killed Jesus. They couldn't care less. Do you think there's any Muslim walking around on the face of this earth is all bent out of shape because the Jew killed Jesus? They've got other reasons why they hate the Jews. Do you think any Asian or Oriental thinks one second or gets bummed out because the Jews killed Jesus? 99% of the people in this world couldn't care less who killed Jesus. So that can't be the reason why the world as such, or Satan in particular, hates the Jews. Technically, if you want to start laying blame, it was just as much blame on the Romans as it was the Jews. Because the Romans did the actual killing as such. They're the ones that beat him up. They're the ones that plucked his beard out. They're the ones that lashed him on the back. They're the ones that drove the, hand, the, the nails in his hands and feet and shoved the crown of thorns in his head. They're the ones that stuck him up on that tree. Rome. Yet nobody seems to get all bent out of shape about, let's hate the Romans because they killed Jesus. So it's just, that's a farce, this whole idea that the reason the world hates the Jews is because they killed Jesus. That, that doesn't compute. The level of hatred that is directed against the Jews, it is so irrational. I mean, what does the, what does the average Jew ever do to anybody? Well, they, you know, I had a jeweler over there. Uh, oh, gee, a jeweler? Uh, money, uh, jewels, uh, precious stones, gems, and so forth, a jeweler, and he ripped me off. Well, we get ripped off every day. We don't make a big national cause out of it. We don't single out a certain group of people and brand them with this thing for generation after generation after generation. Those six million people that Hitler had killed, what do they personally do to him? Nothing. Throw in a couple million more that Stalin wiped out. What'd they do? Nothing. And yet this irrational level of hatred is off the chart. Neo-Nazism is coming back. Skinhead, look at the average skinhead. You know, the shaved head guy, uh, the... the Big old puffy blue jean things, the uh, the army boots up to his you know knees practically, tatted up, pierced up, uh, just a, a real gem that mom wants to meet her daughter, bring home. And they all hate the Jews. Why? Well, I submit that it's not a it's not rational. There's no real reason for it. It's a spiritual thing. Totally spiritual. Started back in Genesis chapter 3. When Satan got the word from God 
that his, Satan's, ultimate demise was going to come through the hands of a man. I mean, the same being as such that he screwed up in the Garden of Eden, it was going to be that same type of a being that was going to be his ultimate demise. Genesis chapter 4, we saw last time we spoke, boom, he kills his brother. Well, he just lowered the odds by 33.5%. We got to Genesis chapter 6. He had been working for 1,500 years. So between Adam's creation and the flood, there was approximately a 1,500-year period in there. During that 1,500-year period, when they're multiplying like rabbits throughout here, multiple conceptions and so forth, there could have been several billion people on the earth at that point. God wipes them all out, down to eight people. Because Satan had been trying to pollute the human race, as it were, the gene pool, and he was successful, down to eight people. So God had to start all over with eight. Genesis chapter 12 comes along, and now God picks a family. So he's gone from mankind in general, and Satan is using a scattered, you know, shotgun type approach. He doesn't know who, who it is. He doesn't know who to watch and so forth. So he just tries to wipe out the whole human race. Gets down to eight people. We get to Genesis chapter 12, and now God has selected a family. Boom, Satan's ears perk up. Now he knows where to channel his efforts. It's not the Babylonians, it's not the Sumerians, it's not the Assyrians, not anybody, the Egyptians or anybody else. He's going after Abraham's family, which is going to be called the Hebrews or the Jews at some point. So we fast forward and we come up another 2,500 years or so to Jesus' time. And by now, Satan knows where the verses are. He knows that there's going to be a virgin that's going to give birth. He knows it's going to be in the town of Bethlehem. He knows approximately, eh, so-so, the timing of this thing. But he doesn't really have, he doesn't have, you know, he doesn't see things always. He can't read your mind. He can't read God's mind. He's... He's basically like us. He just has to figure things out. He's got a couple more tools than we do, but he still has to figure it out. So when the Magi, the three wise men, came in from the east, they tipped the can of beans over to Herod. And they said, oh, where is he that's born king of the Jews? And Herod perks up. And he says, king of the Jews? I thought I was the king of the Jews. There's another king of the Jews. Satan hears this and his ears really perk up. So he puts a little bee in Herod's bonnet. Oh, let's take out this little group of kids and so forth. And so that's when Herod makes the proclamation, let's kill all the little baby boys, two years old and under, because he doesn't have an exact date. So he's just using, again, the shotgun approach. Kill all the little babies, baby boys. Thirty-three years go by. By now, Satan has confronted Jesus on several occasions. The biggie being in the temptation in the wilderness for 40 days. They've talked to each other face to face, eyeball to eyeball. And Satan knows. This is the guy that Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 was speaking about. And so now he goes after Jesus. So he's gone from mankind as such. He's gone from the big family of Jews as such. And now he's focused on one guy. And he knows it's him. And so all throughout Jesus' life, the gospel doesn't make a really big, big deal of this, but they're scattered all through the various times that people tried to kill Jesus in his ministry. Lots of times. 
as he gets close to the final hour. He has his man, Judas Iscariot, in place. He has the mood of the, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all that stuff, got them in place. He's got Rome in his back pocket because Rome doesn't want any problems. So he gets Judas to betray the Lord. Judas goes out and he gets the soldiers, leads them to Jesus, and he says, this is the guy. Satan says, I've got him now. And all hell breaks loose around Jesus. The mock trial, the scourging, the beatings, the whippings, Gethsemane, the whole bit. He gets him up on that cross. The nails are being driven in. He's suspended up on that thing. He can't breathe. Diaphragm can't get any air in. In the process of suffocating, he's losing bodily fluids. He's losing blood. He's, he's going. <clears throat> and Satan is so happy he can't stand it. Psalm 22 will give you an illustration as to what was going on behind the scenes from Satan's standpoint when Jesus was hanging on that tree. And I'm sure that when Jesus cried out, it is finished. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he died and gave up the ghost. Satan thought that he had won next three days was probably just the greatest three days in the history of Satan. But then at some point a little arrow comes into his mindset. A little jab over here. Ooh, didn't I read someplace where he's supposed to raise from the dead? Oh, yeah. Shucks. Didn't I read that, yeah, God's going to raise him uh, up and bring him back to life? Oh, darn. And so now that euphoria that he had for the first part of those first three days there, now it morphs into a doubt. Is he going to come back? Isn't he going to come back? And on that early Sunday morning, late Saturday night type thing, Tomb is opened, and Jesus is up and about, and Satan says, oops, I think there's something wrong. After the resurrection, we go through a 2,000-year period where it's basically payback time for the Jews. Satan has failed in, in his initial attempt to try to have Jesus killed or better yet not even have come to begin with. Hence you have, you know, Genesis chapter 6. Hence you have all the, the persecution of the Jews throughout history, all the invasions and so forth, all the little babies killed in Moses' time, all the little babies killed in Jesus' time, all these things to try to prevent Jesus from coming well, he did come, he did live his life, he did preach, he did die on the cross. So Satan is lost in that respect, so now it's his payback time. It's vengeance, it's being petty now at this point. And who does he go after? He's not going after the Catholics, he's not going after the Romans. He's going to go after the Jews. Two thousand years, Israel was occupied by foreign countries. The people were dispersed. Well, let's start back in the 600 BC that they were dispersed. 70 AD, they really got dispersed. I mean, Roman Rome's come in and just wiped them out. Just a teeny little handful left. First, it was the Romans. Then there was the Persians. Then it was the Byzantines. Then it was the Muslims. Then it was the Crusaders. 
then it was Saladin, then it was the Ottoman Empire, then it was the British Empire. And finally, in 1948, they get their own country. Now, from 70 AD until 1948, they were basically occupied that whole time by somebody, persecuted in their own country. Didn't have their own flag, didn't have a temple, didn't have their own priesthood, didn't have anything. It was payback time, vengeance. Satan is just being vindictive. And all along that way, in that 2000 period time, you have what history refers to as the pogroms. And these were incidents where in a particular city, whether it be Hamburg, Germany, or Manchester, England, or Seville, Spain, or wherever it happened to be, somebody would come in and incite the crowd against the Jews. So you would have this local persecution where the Jewish shopkeepers or the Jewish jewelers or the Jewish bankers or whatever it happened to be, they were all ostracized or their stuff were seized and they were persecuted and they were kicked out, they were exiled and everything was confiscated from them. He had this going on thousands of times in history. The Inquisition, everybody's heard of the Spanish Inquisition. You realize that that was initially directed against the Jew period. Now it eventually morphed into any unbeliever that went against the Catholic Church, but initially the whole purpose of the Spanish Inquisition was to go after the Jew. Again, why? They didn't, what threat did they pose? You know, we sit here in this world, I can remember as a boy, you know, the big boogeyman in the world, it was the Russians, the communists. I remember fourth, fifth, sixth grade and all that stuff, they would have these little drills not fire drills where you walk out the door, they'd have the drills for the nuclear thing where you get into the desk and put your head down and cover your ears and so forth. We're gonna be vaporized anyway. Who cares if you're under the desk covering your ears? You just, if a nuclear thing hits within 10, 15 miles, you're just gonna be vapor anyway. But I remember it was that bad as a young kid. You would have these drills all the time. People would buy these, structures and bury them in the ground these bunkers that if you know if, if the world fell apart well at least you'd have your family you know safe down there for until the food and water ran out so that was our big boogeyman uh, today our big competition is china you know they got you know one and a half billion people or so Trade-wise, they're, you know, they got their hands in everything in the world. They are a threat. Israel's not a threat. What are they going to do? Buy out Manhattan? They've already got it. So what do they need it for? Are they going to invade? No. But nobody makes a big deal about China as such, that everybody still hates that Jew. 2,000 years later, after they killed Jesus, they still hate that Jew. It's incredible. Hitler comes along, kills six million of them. Stalin throws in a couple million more. Nineteen forty-eight. They get their own country. Within 24 hours, they were attacked by four different nations. Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon. They all come down, they all try to wipe out Israel. They get their butts handed to them. 1967, they try it again. Get their butts handed to them. 1973, the Yom Kippur War, they try it again. They get their butts handed to them. It's incredible. This one dinky little country 
is able to hold off, get what, six, seven, eight million Jews in there, in Israel. And they're fending off 150, 200 million Arabs, Muslims. You don't think the hand of God is working in here someplace? State-run anti-Semitism is rampant now. I mean, some countries, is, it's like in their constitution that you have to hate Israel. We're going to drive them into the sea. We're going to erase their name from history. We're going to kill everyone that we find. What, where does this hatred come from? Israel's never been a, you know, since the days of King David, 1000 BC, they've never been an aggressive type country. They've never held territory as such. They've never invaded. They sit there trying to mind their own business and exist. And yet this irrational level of hatred is so pervasive, it is so deep, it is so ingrained into the world's psyche, we can't get away from it. 2019, it's still going on. It's ramping up again. Interesting sidelight here, America. Ever since 1948, when Harry Truman was president, every single American president since has always said, oh yeah, we're gonna, <clears throat> we're gonna make Jerusalem the capital of Israel. It's only the right thing to do. I mean, it is their capital. Everybody knows that, every Jew knows that, everybody in the world knows that as far as the Jew is concerned, Jerusalem is their capital. It's been their capital since day one. Truman said he was gonna do it. Eisenhower said he was gonna do it. JFK said, <clears throat> said he was gonna do it. Lyndon Johnson said he was gonna do it. Nixon said he was going to do it. Ford said he was going to do it. Carter said he was going to do it. Reagan said he was going to do it. Bush one said he would do it. Clinton said he would do it. Bush two said he would do it. And Obama said he would do it. You know how many did it? Zero. Not one single solitary president from Harry Truman on had the guts to do it. Why? What's it going to hurt? Israel's all for it. It's payback time from Satan. It's a spiritual, this is all a spiritual thing. Satan hates the Jew because ultimately it was the Jew that is made his downfall. So he's going to do everything he can to disrupt them, to mess them up, <coughs> to hurt them, just fill in the blank. We get to Donald J. Trump, the most illogical one of all. Not a politician, not a great statesman. He comes along and he says, hey, it's the right thing to do. Jerusalem is going to be recognized as their capital. And the world goes nuts again. What does any Muslim care what the capital of Israel is? What does any Asian care what the capital of Israel is? What does anybody, it's none of their business. It doesn't hurt them. But it's payback time from Satan. And yet every single solitary American president, from Harry Truman all the way to Barack Obama, they couldn't wait to side with the Arabs. They couldn't wait to side with the Muslims and try to ram it down Israel's throat. Oh, you have to give away the Gaza Strip. Oh, you have to give away the Golan Heights. Oh, you have to give away the West Bank. You look at any map of Israel today, 
And every country on a map, there's always a certain color, you know, that goes with that, that country. If you look at a map today and you look at the nation of Israel, there are two colors represented. You got Israel itself, be one color, and then the West Bank, which is from the Jordan River up to around Jerusalem. Or so that's a different color because the world doesn't acknowledge that that truly belongs to Israel. Israel took it in the Six Day War. But the world doesn't recognize it. So you look at a map today and you'll see a two, two separate colors. The West Bank is in one color and Israel itself is a different color. And the West Bank will say West Bank. It won't say Israel. It'll say the West Bank. Meaning the West Bank of the Jordan River. It's incredible. The level of hatred, the level of mental occupation with this thing. You talk about living in somebody's head. The Jew in Israel is living in the brain of Satan and just residing there and kicking back. He can't get it out of his head. And so it, he instigates the world to do whatever he can to upset and to hurt Israel. I've often wondered and it has always amazed me why liberal Jews in America, you know, talking about the bankers, the hedge fund guys, the, the tech guys, whatever, the, the big money guys, why they, they'll always vote liberal, for instance, against Israel, basically. Now, Reagan, he wanted to do good by Israel, and yet the, the politics of the whole thing and having to get along with, you know, blah, 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 it didn't work out. Trump comes along and he says, well, I'm getting screwed every way from Sunday by everybody else. Hey, I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to recognize Israel. He doesn't care. But why is it so hard, you know, when you look at foreign policy, when you look at the things that Israel is trying to do compared to the Arab states around them. They're all for giving the women the right to vote. They're all for women being able to work or drive a car or have, get an education. They're all for all the good things that we adhere to here in America, for the most part. And yet the liberals will constantly vote Democratic. which is, as far as foreign policy goes, is against Israel. And it ne I can never figure that out. Finally, I heard somebody make a remark about that. And he said that the reason why they will vote liberal instead of conservative when it comes to Israel is because the average American Jew loves Judaism but they hate the nation of Israel. Sounds like a dichotomy. It sounds like a, a contradiction of uh, terms here. But they love Judaism. They love the, the history of it, the trappings of it, the, the ceremony of it. They, they love that. The average American liberal Jew. But they hate the nation of Israel. And so these guys will constantly vote to, you know, let's embargo trade goods from Israel. Let's embargo, you know, we're, we're not going to trade with them here. We're not going to buy oranges from them anymore. We're not going to buy flowers from them anymore. We're not going to give them arms anymore. We're not going to do this anymore. And it never made any sense to me until I heard that expressed the way it was. They love Judaism, but they hate Israel. That makes total sense to me. Why the average liberal guy will constantly vote, you know, liberal against Israel. We'll read one passage of scripture here today. And I don't usually get this bad. This is basically a history lesson today, but I think it's important in the world in which we live. Romans chapter 11.
There's one other stroke of genius that God had when he uh, he promised Israel a long time in a hundred different places. He says, you follow me and I'll bless you. You turn your back on me. You start to worship other idols or other gods and so forth. I'll turn my back on you. And one of the aspects of me turning my back on you is going to be I'm going to disperse you throughout the world. And so for 2,000 years, there was not a nation of Israel. You still had a few Jews living in what we call Israel, but it was always called Palestine. It was always called something else. And the Jews were scattered. They were scattered throughout Europe. They were scattered throughout North America, South America. Just wet. They were scattered throughout the world. And because of that, The average person thinks or thought, well, God is done with the Jews. He's all finished with them. He was so ticked off, he was so upset when they killed Jesus that he just washed his hands of the whole bunch. So if God doesn't love them anymore, if God has cast them aside, if God has dispersed them out of his sight, hey, no problem if I do it. So I'm going to hate the Jew. I, I'm going to, you know, walk across the other side of the street or whatever. God knowing that he was going to disperse them and looking down through the corridor of time, he still wanted to retain them as a people. Now, a lot of them that were dispersed back in the 600, you know, B.C., era with the uh, the Assyrians and the Babylonians and so forth they got to a point in their history that they didn't even know that they were Jewish so if somebody were to take you right now and throw you down into Bolivia let's say all right well you know that you're an American because you know you can remember and your kids are born let's say and you told the kids about, oh, how it used to be like life in America, and yeah, you're really an American, but, you know, the kids speaking Spanish, and the kids, you know, hitting the piñatas and so on and so forth. And so another generation comes, those kids have kids. Now, you're gone. You're just a memory in somebody's eyes, so there's no firsthand knowledge that you're imparting to that third generation. And after a while, they forget that they were American at one time. And so after the fourth or fifth generation, hey, we're Bolivian. That's it. We all speak Spanish. We all hit that piñata. We all sing La Cucaracha, the whole bit. And that's exactly what happened to a lot of the Jews. They got carried away into foreign lands. They had to adopt new language, new customs, and so forth. And after a while, a lot of them didn't even know that they were really Jewish. But God did an amazing thing. And this is not a blanket thing that every one of them have, but enough of them have it to maintain that kernel of integrity, that kernel of viability. He gave that Jew an unbelievable talent for making money. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I don't mean that they have to cheat and steal and rob and all the other stuff. They are geniuses when it comes to making money. And God, I believe, gave them that to preserve them through these hard times. Because if you've got money, you can basically withstand anything. You, can, you have the ability to move if you have to. You have the ability to block yourself in a gated community if you have to. You have the money to put iron bars on the windows of your establishment or your business if you want to. There's a lot of things that you can get away with and preserve yourself and maintain yourself if you've got enough money to do it. And so God gave within the heart of that Jew, in a generic way, the ability to make money. 
to help preserve them through this 2,000 year period of complete fanatical hatred and vengeance that Satan was going to unleash on them. And the sad part of it is not over yet. We've got a seven year tribulation coming. And the Jew is going to be dabbed smack in the middle of it. Romans chapter 11, beginning at verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. He's talking about who, who was ever alive at the time of the rapture or the tribulation. Doesn't mean they're going to go all the way back to Moses and Elijah and, and so forth. He's talking about on the future thing. All Israel shall be saved. There shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Verse 27. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, this is God speaking, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. God still loves them, regardless. They are in unbelief right now. They don't accept Jesus as their personal Savior. They don't like Jesus. They don't like the New Testament. They are enemies for your sake as far as the gospel is concerned. Verse 29. For the gifts of calling of God are without repentance. God gave Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He gave them certain promises back in Genesis chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. He gave them promises, and he will not go back on those promises. Verse 30. For as ye in times past have not believed God, that's every one of you, there was a point in your life you didn't believe in God, you didn't believe in Jesus as such, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. The gospel came from Jews. The Bible came from Jews. Our salvation come, came from a Jew. There's no way around it. All of Christianity is an out is a result of Judaism and what they did for us. Verse 31. Even so, have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. So he says, look, you owe everything you've got, Christian, to the Jew. And in turn, because you are going to disseminate the gospel unto them, they will receive mercy from you. So it's like a big wheel turns around. First it was the Jew, then it's the church. Then it's the church that's going to help the Jew. <clears throat> so don't get sucked up into this anti-Semitism junk. Don't, don't buy the idea that, oh, they killed Jesus, therefore me as a Christian, I'm obligated to hate them because they killed my Lord and Savior. doesn't go like that. And this whole thing is predicated by the idea that, you know, here after 2,000 years, anti-Semitism is getting worse and worse and worse. I can't wait, you know, until Jake gets back from Germany and I'm going to ask him how it is on a, on a daily basis over there just on a practical basis, the resurgence of Nazism and so forth. So Satan's going to do everything he can to mess everything up wherever he can, in everything. He doesn't care. He doesn't like you. He doesn't like your Lord and Savior. He doesn't like anything about us. 
He doesn't like this Bible. He doesn't like the songs you sing. He doesn't like anything. And he's going to do his best to mess you up every way he can. Do not buy into the anti-Semitism thing. It's not going to work for you. Heavenly Father, you see these things a billion times clearer than we can see them. You see things that we can't even begin to understand. You can see into the hearts of men. You know the heart of Satan. You know the thought process that he goes through. You know that how he tries to influence his minions, his disciples, his people to do whatever he feels like they should do. And Father, we know that history has to run its course. We know how the end of the book comes out. We know how things are going to end. You have told us repeatedly through the epistles of Paul and other places in that book that we are to pray for the Jew, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I find it incredible that after 2,000 years, this little dusty city, no industry, no infrastructure to speak of, no armies or navies, no, no anything, and yet it is constantly front page news. It's amazing how the biblical prophecies and the biblical laws have revealed themselves as to be spot on. There is no way, Lord, that we should be thinking about Israel today or Jerusalem. And yet, here we are. We're fixated on it. And it just reinforces within my heart, Lord, that what you said is going to come to pass exactly as you've ordained it to be. Father, the Jew has yet to have to go through that tribulation and they will be killed by the millions. But a remnant will exist and get through. And from that, you'll build a new Jewish nation that will inhabit the earth. Father, you know what you're doing. Help us just to get out of your way, to acknowledge the fact that you are God, and let you do and get on with what you are best at doing, making things right. We thank you, Lord. I thank you for this Jewish book. I thank you for the Jewish prophets. I thank you for this Jewish Savior. I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.